Before we jump into the entire course and all of the material, if you're not too familiar with Azure and cloud computing, we're going to just give you a quick overview. So skip ahead if this is a little too basic for you and jump into all the course material, but this will definitely help those of you who are brand new to cloud computing and Azure. And it helps for us to start by just thinking about how we got here. Well, we had traditional data centers and we still have them around today, but not long ago, all the time when we wanted a new application for a business division, often we would go and rack a server, cable it up, do all the necessary things that we needed to do in the data center around power and cooling, etc. You know, rack that server, get an operating system installed, and then you know hand it over to the application team and then they would do all, all their work. Uh, it led to the rise of virtualization first of all, which was around consolidation, you know, and taking those operating systems and consolidating them onto fewer physical machines. And that ultimately is what led to the rise of cloud computing and why we have services and there's so much momentum today around Azure specifically. Well, inside of cloud computing, there are now multiple service models, and you'll hear people talk about these, you know, as they deploy services, the two common ones being IaaS and PaaS, the big acronyms you need to know. Well, if we start with the traditional model, you can see there, if we start from the bottom, we have networking, storage, servers, virtualization, you used to manage all of those, you know, in your data center, you probably manage an operating system, you know, on top of that, you had middleware that you would install, you have your runtime, your data, and your applications. That is the traditional model and led to a very siloed model across each one of those layers in many cases. Along came infrastructure as a service, and in infrastructure as a service, the bottom four are ultimately managed by your vendor. So when we think about IaaS in the cloud world, we often think about virtual machines themselves. Networking, storage, servers, virtualization, although there's configuration to do, the underlying plumbing and everything associated with them is all handled by your vendor, but you still manage the layers on top. The operating system still requires patching, you still have to install your middleware, your runtime, your data, your applications on top, but this is ultimately the infrastructure as a service model, and it's still a highly prevalent model in the cloud world. It's also, when you're trying to do data center migrations, a common way and model that people utilize before they move on to more advanced models. Well, moving up, we go on to PaaS or Platform as a Service. And at this point, we're eliminating more of those layers. So we don't necessarily manage an OS anymore. We don't necessarily manage middleware anymore. And think of this as things like web apps in Azure, where you might deploy a web application on top of an app service plan. And that allows you then to just focus on your application. You don't care about an operating system, patching it, all of those things. Those things are then handled for you. Last but not least, we have SaaS or software as a service where pretty much everything is managed for you by the vendor. Think of these as services like Salesforce, ServiceNow, other services that are out there that you might consume where everything is just handled for you and you basically configure what you want on top of that service. If we then look at Azure specifically and how Microsoft breaks it down, well, they start at the bottom with data center infrastructure. You definitely don't manage any of that. You know, in fact, there's high security when you try and enter an Azure data center. If vendors want to connect to an Azure data center, there's a rigorous process they have to go through. As we move into infrastructure services, we start with compute, and this is virtual machines and now containers as well. Not everything needs to run on a virtual machine. You can often run an app in a container and run that on some of the new services such as Azure Kubernetes service. We have a number of storage services available, so blob, queues, files, disks being the most common ones available to you there. There are a whole host of networking products, and it's a good time to just think about when you're going to consume services from Azure, each one of these serves a unique purpose and something perhaps you configured on premises. Load balancers, traditionally a lot of people had F5 load balancers on premises. And in Azure, they might still continue to use F5, but they might use Azure native load balancing services as well. Same for things like DNS, traffic manager, and network security groups for certain firewall scenarios as well. Moving up, we get our platform services, and this is where Azure gets richer and richer, and the value proposition continues to go up. Because when we get into those PaaS services, we're not worried about all this infrastructure and things we have to connect together. The PaaS services still need to run on top of things like blob storage, and they still need to connect to each other over a virtual network. But a lot of the app teams can now focus on connecting and gluing together the different services that they need. These could be IoT services, these could be bot services, these could be big data services rich amount of services available there. On the right and left, we have a few additional things. On the left, we have security and management, and this is where Azure really, really shines because there's a whole bunch of management tools 
built into the platform for you. There's a whole identity solution with Azure Active Directory, the security center so you can see how vulnerable your environment is, things like Key Vault, Azure Automation, Azure Backup, lots and lots of things available for you there just to make life easier when managing these cloud services. On the right hand side, we have hybrid cloud services as well. Microsoft is not just focused on you moving everything into the cloud. There are scenarios where you might want to manage your on-premises services from Azure. So the identity solution is fully hybrid. We're starting to see Azure AD work with Windows 10 machines as an example. You can use the Azure backup service I mentioned also to back up your on-premises workloads. And there's things like Azure Site Recovery for DR. You might continue to run a workload on-premises, but then have a disaster recovery plan where it can recover to Azure. So this is a slide that you'll probably see over and over again when you're working with Azure and various Microsoft Teams. And it's just good to become familiar with it. The slide is always changing because Microsoft is always adding new services to the platform. Next, let's take a look at the regions themselves. Well, this is continuously being updated as well. We have 54 regions worldwide currently, and they're available in 140 countries. So there are lots and lots of places where you can provision your workloads. And a region is exactly that. It's an area where Microsoft has basically created a data center. And these are very, very large data centers where you can provision your workloads. So you'll see as we go through a lot of the demonstrations and the tutorials that we work through, you can provision into regions that make the most sense for you. Uh, now, something to be aware of is you'll see there's available region, there's announced regions, and there's ones that have like a little dot in them, and that says availability zones are present. Now, when availability zones are present, that means that you can deploy machines and, and other services into those regions, and you could basically separate them by availability zone. And availability zone is like having two data centers in the same region. So if VM A was in availability zone one and VM B was in availability zone two, in that same region, they get higher levels of redundancy in the event of a catastrophic failure to that data center, but they're still close enough together to benefit from very, very low latency. In addition, we also have region pairs. So there's the concept of a region pair in that if Azure or Microsoft specifically are going to update one of the Azure data centers, they're only going to do it one region in the pair at a time. So if you basically deploy your workloads to West US, your region pair would be East US, North Central as an example is paired with South Central. And that means that, you know, if they do do a patch or maintenance to say any of the services up there or the data center in general, uh, maybe they're starting to go through your hosts and do various patching on the underlying hosts that support your machines, they will only patch one of the regions at a time. And so in the event there is a big failure with that, your redundant workload if it is running in say another region because you've got a high availability disaster recovery solution in place, you know, that will continue to run for you. The next thing we need to just become aware of, and we'll revisit this throughout the course, are resource groups. You know, you'll hear me go on about these over and over again, and all the different ways to apply policy and rights to them. Well, it's worth noting early on because a resource group is essentially a container that you can put your resources in. These can be web apps, virtual machines, databases, whatever you want to put inside them. And it helps to get organized very early in your journey with resource groups because there are a way to easily remove and delete resources when you're done. All of your lab stuff, when you're building it, just throw it in a resource group. When you're done for the day, you know, simply delete that resource group and everything inside of it gets destroyed. And this is important because, you know, when we traditionally work on premises, let's say in a VMware environment, we might deploy a VM, we delete that VM, we delete the disks, etc., with it, and that's gone. In the cloud world, there's a lot of ancillary services that go along with a VM. There's like a NIC card that gets deployed. There's sometimes a storage count that gets deployed. You know, there's network security groups that get deployed. But if you group everything together in these containers, it makes it a lot easier to clean things up. And we will go into resource groups in detail throughout the course as we go through. And next, we have our networking. I just want to prime you a little bit because it helps to think about networking in two sides. On the right-hand side right now, as you can see, we have a VNet and two subnets inside there with a bunch of virtual machines inside there. And we'll go through those in more detail on the network security groups and how everything connects together as we get into the networking section. But then on the left-hand side, we have our data center. So often we talk about networking, we could just be in Azure. We don't have to have a data center, but if we want to, we can connect the networks in Azure to our primary data center and connect through there as well. And so you will hear about VPN gateways, Express Route, and other services like that, 
which are basically to allow us to connect into Azure itself. If you don't have a primary data center, do not worry. You know, no demos required by any means in this course. Everything we do, we just provision into an Azure account that you will see as we go through. Well, with that brief overview out of the way of cloud computing and the Azure platform, let's take a minute just to think about how we access Azure. The primary mechanism you'll use throughout this course is the portal itself, which is at portal.azure.com. And we do have a module where we will create a trial account and walk you through that process. But you can also access it with PowerShell and the Azure CLI as well. A lot of the labs in the exam don't care how you get to the final product. You can do it in the portal or you can do it through PowerShell. In some cases, you will be asked to identify PowerShell code and know what's going to happen. So I encourage you to learn PowerShell as well as learning how to do things in the portal itself. But for right now, we'll go into the portal and just give you a brief tour of Azure. If this is your first time seeing an Azure portal, then welcome. And it is truly an absolute delight from a management perspective. And some things just to get familiar with straight away as you're beginning your journey through there. Well, on the left-hand side, we have a few key things here. Create a resource. This is where you go to create new services that you want to run in Azure. We've got our home screen, which brings me back to this panel I'm at right now. This is the new home screen that Microsoft released only a few months ago, and you know they continue to update it. So things may change you know, throughout the course as you're going through because Microsoft is continuously making updates to Azure itself. We have dashboards. This is where you can configure various monitors and widgets and things that you can put in here. They give you a couple to get you going. If you don't want to make changes to the default one, you can go ahead and just create a new dashboard by clicking this plus sign at the top here. Then we have all services. This is where you can see all the services that are available in your subscription. And you can basically go ahead and search for them as well. So say you wanted to provision new virtual machines, you can go to the virtual machine service. If you wanted to look at Azure Active Directory, you could type in Azure and you can see right there, we've got Azure Active Directory as well. Any of the services that we want quick access to, we can favorite by clicking the star button right here. And that puts them on the left hand side. Uh, there will be a number in your favorites already, especially if you're just creating a brand new account. Microsoft puts a whole bunch in there for you already. And then you do have this favorite here, all resources. This is a useful one because if you just want to see everything you've got running, uh, you can see all of those resources here and you can scroll through them. You can click on them and go into them as well. The other area is just to bring your attention to on the top, we have our search bar where we can search any of the services that we have. And for any of the you know subscriptions and things we have, we can do all that up there as well. Uh, we can also open up a PowerShell window directly inside of what's called a Cloud Shell now. So this is where Microsoft actually provisions a container in the background running PowerShell for you, completely free to do. You basically click the button, it requests a Cloud Shell, and you can choose between PowerShell or a Bash Shell as well. So you have two ways there. If you do want to learn PowerShell, this is the fastest way to just get PowerShell open and authenticate with Azure without you having to go through too many hoops there as well. So that's useful to know. Uh, moving along on the top bar, we have the directory and subscription. So if you have multiple, in fact, I'm going to close this PowerShell window down. So if we have multiple domains, uh, those would basically be here for you as well. Uh, we have the alert section, which just shows you all the notifications as services are provisioned, deleted, any other events, uh, you might see them here. And you also have a link directly to the activity log from there as well. The little cog that you see at the top here is where you can customize your scheme. Uh, so things like you want to go super dark, you can go to this one, you can go, you know, light blue here. There's definitely multiple options there. So pick whatever, you know, you like the best, doesn't affect anything that we are going to do. Uh, we have the help section here where you can put in support tickets as well. We have the feedback section where you can basically get feedback directly to Microsoft. And last but not least, we have the account section where if you click your name on the top right, that's where you can log out completely and log into other accounts. So highly encourage you, you know, follow through the module on creating a trial account and then go in here, just have a little play around, maybe just provision a VM and destroy everything you've got there. Just get familiar with the portal, get your favorites organized, and that'll just help you have a smooth run through the course. But with that, this concludes this portion of the intro module, and we look forward to seeing you as you continue to go through.